welcome to the conservation studio at Essex Local Office. Uh, I'm Tony King, I'm the senior conservator here. Um, we've got a few bits and pieces out for you to look at, and uh, I'll tell you more about conservation as we go along. Um, so, we're mainly here to uh, repair, uh, stabilise, conserve uh, documents which come to us in bad condition. Um, our storage and boxing is really good here, so hopefully, all the damage has occurred before it's come to us. Uh, we also clean up stuff as it arrives, uh, make boxes and package things up. So here, um, these are all parchment documents. Um, parchment is a great archival material. Uh, you may have seen our earliest document, which is upstairs, um, from about the year 650-ish, and uh, that's on parchment, and it's still going strong. So as long as it's looked after properly, it, um, it will last. Uh, parchment is an animal skin product. Uh, it's normally sheep skin. Uh, it can be goat, or even deer, or calf. But uh, sheep's the most common material, because there were a lot of sheep around in medieval. But um, the skin is uh, processed in a similar way to leather, but it's not tanned. It's um, soaked in lime and then stretched and dried. It makes a very different material. Um, but a really good writing material. Uh, this is a bit of new parchment. Uh, you can still buy parchment. There's one manufacturer still going. Um, and if I pass it around, you can feel what a great, strong material it is. Um, you'll feel also it's very shiny on one side and buffed on the other side. So um, we order it like this for repair work, so we can glue that to things, we can stick it, it's shiny, so it's more difficult, but um, the feel of that. These are some documents that haven't fared so well. Um, this is not terribly old, it's from about 1917, I think. Uh, it's a piece of parchment which has been wet, and it's stayed wet. The problem is, the, the collagen, which parchment's made from, is broken down into gelatin. So this is more or less a sheet of gelatin now. It's not really parchment anymore. And uh, I'll hand this around as well, and um, you can feel how it's got a bit brittle in places, and it's a bit transparent now. Um, there's not a lot we can do with this, apart from keep it dry. If it got wet again, mm -hmm. it would dissolve and go gooey like a sheet of gelatin, really. So it's a bit of a problem. That one. These are documents we're not planning on conserving, which they're kind of examples of damage. So don't worry about it. Um, at the other end of the scale, uh, this big roll of parchment has been in a fire. So you can see it's all there, really, but it's all shrunk up. If you look at the, um, the writing at the top there, um, when I hand it round, uh, you'll see there's probably a lot of information here, but it's trapped in there. It's so brittle now that we just couldn't unroll that. Uh, it may be in the future there is a treatment for this sort of damage, that uh, maybe something could be applied that would soften it up. Or um, there's even work going on um, in a university in Cardiff, or Aberystwyth, I think, uh, some kind of scanning type machine which can scan rolled parchment documents and read the ink from inside somehow. Um, so maybe we can send that off, but that sort of imaging. Has that not been opened at all? Is no, it? Just, no, no, just break, <laughs> no you can, when you feel it, uh, it's just so it? brittle. Ah. It's snap, for sure. So we've not even tried. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow, yeah. This document, um, it looks like it's been tortured. Uh, but it's been flattened. So this came in and it was very, very creased, and you can still see it's kind of undulating in area. Um, and we're trying to flatten it out. Uh, this method replicates part of the making of the parchment, so it may look quite brutal, but it's, it's already been through it once. Um, when they made it, then, when it was wet, as I said, they stretched it over a wooden frame and let it dry, sort of held like that. So this was humidified, so we uh, introduced moisture to it very slowly. And parchment became very uh, pliable and it expanded. And then uh, we pegged it out, restrained it with these bits of elastic. And then what's going to happen as that dries over the weeks, and it takes a very long time to dry fully, um, it will contract and the tension pulls out some of those creases for us. So it's got a bit of a way to go yet. But that doesn't need very much repair. You can see it's just really flattening there. Um, this document has been repaired and finished. So you can see the holes. Um, I think that's a mouse that's been eating that. Um, they're very neat, round holes. So I think that was folded, and that must have been a corner or something, and they tuned it. But we've infilled the holes with uh, new parchment, so like that piece I handed out earlier. And the way we repaired this is to to cut, to shape the, um, the piece, the repair piece, slightly larger than the hole, just a few millimetres. And then using a scalpel, we thin out the edge, and it becomes almost transparent. So that little couple of millimetre overlap, where it goes over text, should be almost transparent. You can have a good look at it. And uh, we've stuck that on with uh, gelatin. 
So we've got all sorts of animal products here. <laughs> so it's uh, parchment, sk animal skin, and gelatin. And the reason behind that is, is that parchment is very sensitive to humidity and humidity changes. So if this was to go into a dry environment, it would lose a lot of moisture very quickly, and it would start to try and um, sort of uh, almost turn into the animal type shape because it doesn't want to be flat. This was on an animal, so it's a 3D um, shape. And it, flat isn't its natural um, appearance, really. So it would start to curl up, um, and that movement can also um, set off tears and stresses in the document. So by having uh, parchment as the repair um, material and gelatin as the adhesive, it means they all act together. So as this loses moisture, the repairs lose moisture at the same rate, and it won't uh, cockle up or uh, cause sort of creases out from the repairs where it's not reacting in the same way. So it's a like for like kind of uh, approach. Any questions about parchment before we move on? Yes. Um, if you wanted to write something now hmm. that you wanted your ancestors to read in the future, would parchment be your choice that you would write it? Um, what, what would you that use? would certainly have a very good chance of uh, yeah. a long term survival. Um, but paper also lasts pretty well, early paper. A good quality acid free or archival, they might brand it as an archival quality paper, should last very well. So well that would probably be better than this then, if this is so sensitive to humidity. Yes. Um, yeah, th this will, will last for a very long time, as long as it's like a damp or in mold or anything. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, a good quality paper should last a long time as well. As long as, yeah, it's not as robust, but almost, mm -hmm. I'd say. Um, yes, parchment is still used for various things now. Um, Houses of Parliament use it, uh, all the new legislation's written on parchment, um, and some kind of very high grade certificates and things on parchment. Um, so it's not quite a dead technology, but, yeah. but it does last incredibly well. Right, um, I've got some more things to look at over there. Uh, if you want to go kind of round the back of that sink, and, and this would have hung from a big parchment bottle, so um, it's like this, yeah. it's a much smaller version, obviously. Uh, but at some point that's failed and the seal's become adrift. And uh, as you can see, hopefully under here, uh, it's fragmenting a bit. Uh, so these are made from beeswax, and they're quite delicate with uh, any kind of pressure or bash or anything. Um, so if we were to conserve this, we would um, we'd use beeswax, um, unbleached beeswax, for the local beekeeper, <laughs> which we melt and then essentially kind of dribble into the cracks and then hold it together while it sets. And that should hold that. Um, there won't be a particularly strong repair, but the way we'll package it up should uh, provide a lot of support. We don't need to over-repair. In conservation, we try and do the bare minimum we have to. We don't want to interfere too much with historical documents. So this kind of light touch approach is what we're going for. Uh, right, I'll show you um, how we'd clean this. We're cleaning it throughout the day, so I've got to find a dirty patch. Um, I'm going to use um, a solution with a piece of some detergent in it, which is um, it's essentially what's in wash out liquid, it's kind of like purified version. So you just see it sort of foaming a little. And uh, it's quite good to get it in the crevices of the impression. This can be very satisfying. It can really improve things. Um, they have a build up of dust and the impression kind of gets lost. And I've got some distilled water. Hopefully it's different. <laughs> no, just a swab off. Mm -hmm. What is the bridge a little bit? So, um, yeah, I mean, once that's cleaned up, that should, that should look quite nice, and we'll preserve that some well. um, Here's a document packaged up. Uh, it's got a much smaller seal. Um, so again, another partial document with uh, the beeswax seal there. These are much more common sort of seals, rather than the large grey seals. So it's quite a nice way of packaging it up. So it's held in this foam, so we get back down. And we want to keep a little bit of pressure on this document. 
all the materials we use, whether it's packaging materials or uh, a repair material that's been stuck to the document, it's all tested to make sure that over time it won't yellow or give off gases or acids that can do damage. It's all sort of archival grade material, uh, which makes it quite expensive. Okay, um, I've got some books and things to look at here, so you can come around and take a look. On the video, so I'll put it on. Um, this video shows a particular conservation technique which was used on these two documents. Um, it's a bit awkward to watch and obviously at the same time, but it's online, it's on our YouTube channel. Have a look. Right, um, so, yeah, so these two had very similar damage and they've both been repaired in the same kind of way. Um, this is a um, book from 1580, and it's Alehouse Licensing Information, essentially, from Colchester. Um, and it, it's in, it survived quite well, but it got damp at some point, and you can see how much how much loss there was, uh, especially the first few pages. Um, as you go through, it's not quite so bad. Uh, this was the cover that was on it originally, uh, and you can see how much it shrunk actually. So yes, it had suffered quite a bit. So uh, the repair process for this was um, first off, we document everything, so we go through it and examine it. Um, we cleaned it up and we washed it. So each page was floated in the bath of water, which um, washes out any hopefully all acidity and dirt and any sort of degradation products that have built up over time. Uh, people are quite surprised we can wash paper documents, and particularly with ink on. Uh, but this sort of ink, this is iron gall ink, which is, acts slightly differently from our modern ink. So our modern inks we want to be water soluble, so we can wash them with our and stuff. But this is a chemical ink almost, and it's burnt into the paper. So it's, it's really soaked in and really bonded into the paper. So it won't, or shouldn't, at least, uh, wash out the water. But we do test, so we're testing all the inks before giving it a bath. So that's the, the process. And then um, the actual repair of it, can you see there's um, new paper? Hopefully you can see the difference there. Um, that was done using this technique called leaf casting, which this video is all about. And uh, it's a wet process whereby uh, paper pulp is made up. So you blend it up in a load of water, and the document's put at the bottom of a tank, and the water with the pulp in is put on, poured in above it. And then a vacuum's turned on, it draws the water and the pulp through a fine mesh underneath the document, and it means the actual pulp itself is deposited in all the gaps, because the water can go through, but the pulp can't. So once it's dried and pressed, um, we get new paper, basically, cast, to fill all the holes. It's a really nice way of preparing them, actually. And we've got some very fine tissue, you can just see along some of these edges, there's a little bit of tissue on the, on the weakest areas, holding it together. So, uh, oh yeah, do you want to move around? There'll be a chance later on to as well. So, yes, uh, that's the, the finished result. Um, in conservation, we, we keep all the fragments, all the bits. So this cover has been removed because well, it wouldn't do a very good job of protecting it, really. So um, that's been taken off, but it, it's been preserved and kept with it. So they tell a sort of story together. And also the whole structure of this has been recreated. Um, this, obviously, these pages are sewn into this cover, and that, the exact style of that has been recreated. To sort of pictures and diagrams of the structure because that um, kind of is part of it and it can supply information as well. It's not just the writing inside these things that supplies the information, it can be the way it's put together or that can tell you how it was used or how people thought of it at the time. Um, and this is very similar as well. This is quite an interesting document in itself because um, it's a form of recycling. Um, you can see this, this writing here runs the other way and it's very different handwriting to the rest of it. So this is an earlier hand who obviously used this paper and it was recycled at some point, probably hundreds of years later. Um, because paper is such an expensive item back there, um, they took a whole load, folded it up and made a notebook. It's a really nice example of reusing it. Okay, um, one last book to show you. Um, this is a book of watercolours. Um, these are architectural plans and then a little artist impression of the plan. So this belongs to an architect's firm, and uh, I can imagine it was used as a catalog. So if you wanted a, a barn or a stable to put up, you go to them, have a leaf through here, and see other things they've built, and really nice watercolours of uh, how they look.
This is quite a bad state of the case because all the pages were loose and the binding had fallen apart. But it's quite a nice example of um, some of their conservation <coughs> principles here. That we've not re restored this at all. Um, it's obvious that it's an old book that's had a bit of a hard life. Um, all we've done is uh, consolidate it and preserve it. Uh, we've had to put new leather on it so it functions as a book. But the original old book cloth there is still there, still stained and a bit grubby. And on the back where the cloth had fallen off, we hadn't tried to replace it because um, that's okay, that's not going to get any worse. So it's a, it's a difference between conservation, which is more about stabilising and preserving, rather than restoration, which is about like, repairing and making things look like new. All our repairs have to be quite visible, so you can see what's done, and they have to be reversible as well. I would say it's a poor hour. So you're a fifth all day. Um, so all our repairs can be taken off. Um, even this sort of thing, which looks quite um, permanent, if, um, if that's put in a bath of water, all those repairs should float away. So all the adhesives are water soluble, so they will reverse. And they will be tested to prove that, they can prove that in the future, in 100 years' time, they're still being reversible. Um, so the reason behind that is in the future, if a conservator sees the work we've done and thinks rubbish what they're doing, they can take off all our repairs and have another go. Uh, this is because we've seen work that was done maybe 50 years ago, and so that's a good problem to occur with it, uh, and we wish we could undo it. So that's what we have to do as well. Mm -hmm. okay, any questions about any paper repair or parchment or anything you've seen? Good. Right, I'll hand you over to Marcus then. Um, I'm a volunteer here, I come in on Thursdays and I repair the books in the search room. Um, they get a lot of handling as you know, and as you'll, if you've used the search room you'll see that a lot of the books there, they, they, the spines have come adrift, sometimes the boards have come adrift and sometimes the whole book block and all the pages are coming loose as well. So every book that we look at is going to be different and it's the most frequent uh, failure is a failure in the spine and the board's coming loose but sometimes the whole block the stitching has gone and the only uh, the only solution to that problem is to dismantle the book completely and start again and reassemble it. That's what we've done with this one we've taken it to pieces. The book block which is all of the pages uh, comprises lots of different sections the section is several leaves of paper called folios which are put together and then folded down the centre and then they're stitched together into a pile. When I started today this was just one section on this uh, sewing frame and now it's up to here and we're about three quarters of the way through this book. So what we do is we, um, we look at each leaf, first, each folio first and the greatest strain in, the, in each piece of paper is on the uh, the fold line there, where all the fibres of the paper have been folded, and very often they split. And if it's split, then it's pointless trying to sew it, because there's nothing for the stitching to hold on to. So the first thing we do is we repair any uh, folio which has got that split. I mean, what we do is take a piece of Japanese paper, which I think Tony's probably explained to you is very thin, but has very long, strong fibres in it, and we stick that with paste onto the Sp uh, onto the, uh, the torn part of the leaf so that we've now got a strong piece of paper to sew. Uh, to sew. And then we mark the area of stitching. We do a very simple guide so that all of them will be stitched in the same place. And um, we don't put the stitches in the same place necessarily as they were originally. Um, this book originally had only three cords supporting the block, but because the paper has deteriorated and is now quite fragile, we decided that for to use this as a usable book for the public to, uh, to be able to open and, and, and use for the information it contains, uh, it would be best to put an extra cord in, and that's what we've done here. Some books are assembled, the, the cord is what will hold the block into the case, the boards. And some books use cord. Uh, you'll have seen on old books sometimes they've got ridges around the spine where the cord is, uh, 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 is where they've shaped the leather to make room for the cord. Um, but later, instead of cord, they started using tape, uh, um, which is much flatter, of course. 
So we're going to prick this one first, and we use a simple pull. There we are. And that's now pricked and ready to be. So I'm going to put that one on this pile. Those are uh, um, the next sections to be incorporated. And here's one which I started, but my thread was running short, so I'm going to connect a new thread to that. This is linen thread. So we take a, a usable length. And we're going to attach it to the old one using something called a weaver's knot. So we make a little loop like that. Hopefully. And we pop the old one through there. We draw it up so that it's going to fall between two stitching points inside the section. And we snap it tight and we feel it click. And that way we know that it's now secure. And we cut the ends off, leaving two or three millimetres. And we've now got a new thread ready to sew. So we take the old thread off the needle. Because we've locked it onto the needle, it's slightly awkward to get it off, so it's best just to use a scalpel and cut it off. Thread that on. This time you wish you got the eyesight of a teenager, but I haven't. <laughs> A short interval while I thread this. Mm -hmm. There it is. It's gone through now. And all I do is I just reverse it. Because what I don't want to do is to the thread to come off the needle. So I've pushed the needle through the thread, push it off like that. It's now locked on there. Before I start sewing, I'm going to lubricate it with beeswax so that it will draw through the stitching, through the uh, holes in the paper and round the cords more smoothly. And now we'll sew this section on. And for those who can't see the blind side, I'll turn this round when I've finished this section. I'm taking it round the cord, out through. I make sure what I don't do is poke it through the cord because I want the cord to be loose within that stitching so that afterwards we can shape the block. And I'll show you what I mean by that um, when I've finished doing this. And there you see the knot is lying between the last hole and the new hole. Back in. And we keep a reasonable tension, but not too much in the thread. Do the next one. And then round the cord and back in through the same hole. And then out through the bottom. Now have to be careful not to put too much tension in when we take this last thread because the only thing the only thing stopping that thread now pulling back through the paper back to the last cord is the strength of the paper itself, which is not considerable. So we've now sewn that on to the cords, but what we haven't done is given it any relationship with the section next to it. So the next thing we'll do is to stitch it onto the section next to it using something called a kettle stitch. We reverse the needle so that the needle won't damage any of the paper. I push it between 
the previous two sections, bring it out until there's a small loop, or at least I should have done. There we are. Pop it up through the loop and then give it a little tug. Now, not only is it sewn onto the cords, but it is now locked onto the section next to it, and I'm ready to do the next section, which I take off the pile, and because I'm very cautious at my age, I check that the page number really is consecutive. So that's what we do there. Now, when we've sewn everything, all of those onto here, and the block will be up here, it will look, there you are, that's what we've been doing. You can see all of the stitching to the cords, and you can see all of the kettle stitches running along there. But you can see also that this is a flat section here, and you're probably more familiar with books having a rounded spine. So when we've finished the block and it's complete, we take it out and we round the spine before we do anything more. Uh, and that's why we don't put. That's why we need the cords to be able to move within those stitches to facilitate the reshaping of the spine to give it some round to, to make it round. When we've done that, we're going to start then. Um, we're going to then uh, uh, we do some preparation on the spine with glue and aligning the spine, and then we start preparing it to. Uh, to go into the case and we rebuild the case. Now because we've used so much uh, paper to reinforce the, uh, the hinge points of the paper, we've increased the bulk of the book quite considerably. It's probably going to be three or four millimetres thicker than uh, the original one, which means that the original case, even if it wasn't in two pieces, uh, wouldn't fit it anymore. And so what we'll what we'll do is reassemble these two boards together by lifting the leather there, inserting book cloth. This is this is a typical book cloth here. It won't be this colour. <laughs> That's a um, so I'll give you a bit of history of this, this map. Um, it's, the map in itself isn't archival, it's there's lots of these best produced, but it's all the annotations on them really that are the, the, the important part and the bit that's interesting for anybody coming to the search room. Now it's had a quite a hard life, it's been rolled up and it's got damp and it's lost quite a lot of, its, uh, of this information right around this end here and it's quite fragile so it's closed to the public so nobody can come in and, and access it. So the only that is our main object is to get everything accessible to the public. So, um, so, uh, so we could, so Anything that comes in first, and anything we start working on, we have to give it a clean. Uh, we manually clean everything before we start work. Just if you put any um, moisture onto it before cleaning it, then it would absorb all the dirt. So good as clear. Good old-fashioned erasers. <laughs> we do lots of erasing and cleaning everything that way. And we use smoke sponges. These were first developed for obviously for smoke damage documents after they've been in a fire. But um, those are very good for uh, documents which have got. Um, at the surface, which is quite um, uh, delicate, so it's like parchment, really good for cleaning them as well. So it's, it's quite soft, it picks up a lot of the surface dirt. Now this is quite hardy, this document, because it's mass produced, and, and um, so we gave it a clean up with some razors. Um, tested the inks, uh, some of them did move, so we couldn't put it in a bath of water, which we, we, we like, because so that gets a lot of the dirt out. But we, we blotter washed it. So we laid it on some blotters down the bench, put the document down, sprayed it with water, and the, and the blotters actually uh, then absorb any of the, see some of the dirt that comes out of them. <laughs> you get a, and you can absorb it out of the dirt. It takes as much as you can out without taking you know, up to some inks, really. So it's a way of getting another surface dirt off. So we gave it a wash. And so th this process, you would usually do the whole thing wet, including the infills, but we wanted to get it onto the onto the wall yesterday, and so we're doing the infills here. So we've got a release layer onto our mat wall. So this is a glass wall. Um, this is terraline. It just stops our mat stops the mat sticking, really, because we don't want to get it off at the end of the day. Um, this mat was also um, originally lined with uh, linen, so we're going to replicate that. So we're taking the old linen off. It's falling off anyway. So that all came off, it was 
it's giving them no support to the map, so I um, cleaned that old pedal spanner with glue off and that came off. Um, and so we've pasted up the new linen and then on top of it the map. And then we're going to do in I'll show you just briefly how to do the infills and that adds strength to the document. So when this is quite weak around this area, if you've missing areas, then by putting the infill onto them, then you get added strength to the document. I have done most of it before, so it won't take too long <laughs> before everybody. Let's put some um, polythene up just to protect it. Okay, so I'm using um, Griffin Mill paper, which is a handmade um, Western style paper. I use a lot of Japanese film pairs as well because it's got a good strength to, to weight ratio. But this is because this is quite a thick quite a thick paper, we want to use it like for like and thickness, so okay. there's some Japanese paper there if you want to have a fill, and these are the Griffin Mill, and uh, just, we're very lucky to have this lovely big matte wall, so not everybody is very good at some types of So then you just follow the contour of the area. some patience. <laughs> it's not so bad this one because there's only one chunk. But often if you've got lots of sort of missing areas like this then we've like that's got a feel it out in building already and I'll do a little infill on that area as well. So often if it's missing lots of little tiny bits it can take some time. So this one's a wheat starch paste. We make up ourselves so we're using um, powdered wheat starch. Um, it's inert, it's really good for it's reversible. Um, get through a lot of it, so it's really relatively cheap. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, it gives us a good repair. We've been very lucky with this map. It's got five big holes and there's five tour groups. So everyone's got to see. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, saw it. We thought, oh, lovely. <laughs> Let's see what else we've got. Oh, we've got some more paper. Yeah, 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 Down so perfect the rest of the time. <laughs> so any fragments we get we, we save. We can if we can fit them back on then we will. If we've got any doubt of where they where their home is then we uh, 
This is the other um, advantage of yeah. being versatile. Yes, so if you take it off, you do yes. it. <laughs> so that's good. I've rolled it down, make sure it's all done, it did really well. Once it's all dry, if you leave it up there for a few days, a week, maybe something like that to dry, make sure it's really dry, and then we cut it out, the, take it off, peel it off the wall, cut it back, trim it round. So that's a, once again, it's the original size and then put it back into storage. So mm -hmm. this one's been um, stored and uh, rolled, so the linear will help with that. So, and then it'd be accessible for anybody else. Yeah, so it's really mm -hmm. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> magic! Magic! magic. <laughs> is it fun magic? <laughs> it's quite fiddly and sometimes if this little area where it, this is quite strong even though it's had some mould damage, if it was very weak and it was um, it's going to flake off, then you might put a layer of Japanese to show the top. But we were trying to try to make it so it's as clear the information is as clear as possible. So the amount of handling this one's going to get, this is, this is going to be strong enough. So that um, these little, these little um, infills here you might just put your covering of Japanese tissue over the top just to strengthen it out. So. But that's it really. So mm -hmm. it's not a long process, it's lots of steps. Everything we do, it's got lots of steps in it and lots of waiting around for things to dry. <laughs> so we always have two or three jobs on the, on the same time going. So because then we can, you know, we do one process, we might have to go, like we've got um, parchment being stretched out, we'd leave that a couple of weeks maybe to make sure so it's just there and we do other jobs in between. So, But mm -hmm. uh, we get to do a wide variety of things really just because mm -hmm. that's the nature of our collection. And, and there's only two of us to do it, so we can't specialise really. <laughs> we can't be specialists in one particular field. So, but uh, yeah, Lynn, books, uh, you know, books, parchment, paper. So we can How old is that map? Oh, it's only uh, not that old, 1913. Okay. So, mm. Yeah, it's a mass produced, it's machine-made paper. It's mm. quite big. If, I mean, we wouldn't bother repairing it if we didn't have this on it. So, because there's probably thousands of these, but mm. it's just this that just makes it quite unique. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of quality. So, mm. But yeah, I've got another one exactly the same to do, so we'll do the same, I said, exactly the same damage, obviously we've been stored the same. And as Tony said, storage is the, is the, yeah. Yeah, the damage it has before it comes here, you know, for sort of reversing mm -hmm. that. So we do a lot of cleaning. Mm -hmm.